Hi, I'm Sun Yang He. I'm a professor at Michigan State University, and I'm an investigator of Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Today, I'm going to tell you uh, about the fascinating world of pa plant pathogen interactions. Now, why do we care about plant pathogen interactions? Um, some of you may know a disease called potato uh, late blight. Um, this disease um, devastate, devastated the, the potato uh, crop uh, in 1840s in Ireland. Uh, that, um, event uh, basically killed uh, about a million uh, people and uh, another million uh, immigrated, uh, forced to immigration out of Ireland. And many of them actually end up in the United States. So this just illustrates how a plant disease can have a, a profound effect on uh, human survival and immigration. Uh, there are many uh, such diseases, not to this scale, but they are major threats to uh, global food security. So one of the other diseases, you know, like rice blast, I grew up with in China. I live in a small village. Uh, and it was you know, very severe when I was growing up. But, uh, you know, now I go back uh, 40 years later, it's still a, a very severe disease. In fact, this is the number one disease in rice production across the globe. There are also uh, new diseases like uh, uh, kiwi uh, bacterial canker which is caused by a bacterial pathogen that I'm very familiar with called Pseudomonas ringi, sweeping across the uh, New Zealand and some European countries right now. So you see there are old and new diseases they, they really pose a great threat to agriculture. And so the, I, uh, many researchers are you know, involved in uh, 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 trying very hard to understand the molecular basis of these diseases. And the uh, goal is to uh, hopefully to come up with very uh, innovative solutions to solving all these diseases. It's been very uh, challenging, but I think you know, this is an area that we have to do because the crop production has to increase uh, uh, to uh, meet the demand of the rising population in the next uh, century, actually, right? Uh, so uh, the disease is one of the obstacles uh, to increase the yield production and also quality, you know, disease affect quality as well. And so in today's, uh, uh, this part of my uh, talk, I'm going to introduce uh, some of the very general concepts dealing with host pathogen interactions. Uh, on the one side, I'm going to talk to you about plant immunity. Yes, plants do have immune response like a human, uh, but I also want to talk about uh, pathogen virulence factors, uh, or we call it effectors. Uh, that's part one. In part two, I'm going to uh, illustrate these concepts um, using the uh, model Arabidopsis pseudomonas ringi system that we and many others are actually working on. So I hope he's uh, able to watch both parts because you only uh, see one, you may not get enough uh, uh, information uh, from this talk. So what does effect the trigger immunity in plants? There's an older name for this, I call it actually gene for gene resistance. Uh, this is describing a phenomenon probably noticed by farmers, by you know, um, a lot of people over many years, thousands of years probably. It is, you know, if you go into the wheat field, uh, where there's different cultivars are planted. Uh, some cultivars will be severely diseased uh, in some years, and at the same time, some cultivars will be green and you know, yielding really well. Uh, what's the molecular basis of it? What's the genetic basis of it? And it was being you know, puzzling for many people uh, for a long time until this uh, scientist uh, um, named H.H.M. Floor. Uh, he's a, a plant breeder and a plant pathologist. He studied a, uh, a disease called the flax uh, rust disease. It's caused by a fungus. He's very careful. He studied many strains of uh, fungal uh, uh, pathogen, but also uh, many cultivars of the uh, flax uh, um, plant, and uh, uh, studied the genetics of, of the interaction and came up with this very interesting hypothesis called gene for gene hypothesis. What he thinks is that maybe the pathogen has so called avirulence genes or AVR genes, some strains, and some cultivars that are resistant contain so called. Uh, resistant genes or R genes, okay? So this is the, the uh, diagram he uh, would uh, describe these interactions. If you take in a pathogen without any avirulence genes, it's going to infect the plants that either have R genes or no R genes, right? It's because it's virulent, okay? But if when a pathogen has an AVR genes in it, it's going to only infect the plants with no corresponding R genes, okay? Which is depicted right here. If the plant has R genes that can recognize genetically of this AVR gene, then the plant will be resistant. So you need both the R genes in the plant, but also AVR genes in the pathogen for a plant to be resistant. So 
uh, this has, you know, was a hypothesis only, okay? But uh, about 10 or you know, 15 years later, there's actually molecular proof for the existence of these uh, uh, interactions. So uh, uh, scientists start to clone these so-called AVI genes from different kind of pathogens. The initial uh, few are AVI genes actually clone from bacteria. And this is done by uh, Brian Staskowitz uh, at UC Berkeley and the late uh, No King from UC Riverside. And then at about 10 years later, a number of our genes uh, have been cloned from plant, uh, different plant species, okay? So there was some original uh, prediction of how the AVR proteins and our protein would work, actually, right? So the idea was really inspired by animal uh, receptor signaling kind of model. Uh, it says that, you know, this AVR protein may be made in the pathogen, but it's secreted outside of the bacteria, okay? And uh, 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 the R proteins may be receptors. They may be in the membrane of the plant cell. So it indicates that this classical ligand receptor kind of interaction. Um, uh, when the AVR uh, genes and the R genes are cloned, you know, we'll see whether this model actually holds, right? So uh, as I said, many R genes being cloned from different species against different kind of pathogens. So we have N gene cloned from tobacco against a viral pathogen. Uh, a CF9 gene, you know, the names is not that important, but this particular gene is against a fungal disease uh, called the uh, leaf mold. Uh, there's also, you know, genes, uh, our genes that, are, that are against the bacterial diseases, uh, in this case from Arabidopsis, and also uh, some our genes are actually against uh, uh, worms, like right, nematodes. So it's very different kind of pathogens. Initially, we were thinking about maybe there's different kind of uh, R genes, you know, molecularly. But it turns out many of these genes actually share the same kind of motif, uh, including this called a leucine rich repeat, or LRR. And this is very exciting because if you line up the sequence against a database, some of the genes that come up are actually involved in uh, animal immune immunity, so immune receptors. For instance, not one at the bottom of this uh, diagram here, it contains the leucine rich repeat, like the plant uh, receptors here. Also contains so-called MB domain or nucleotide binding domain. So here's a very interesting parallel between animal immune system and plant immune system that are based on the same kind of protein to uh, defend against different kind of pathogens. So uh, remember this model that I showed you just uh, uh, a few minutes earlier that uh, indicate that these AVI proteins may be secreted from a pathogen. And, it, and our proteins are probably localized to the plasma membrane in the host cell. When you look at the AVR protein sequence, however, you actually don't see this classical signal peptide that indicate the protein will be secreted through this conventional uh, secretion system uh, in the bacteria. So this model is probably not correct for in, in terms of this particular step. And actually, it turns out most of our proteins are not also not localized to the uh, plant, uh, plasma membrane as uh, originally predicted. Uh, uh, most of them actually localized inside of the cytosol. So what's going on? Oh, this is really a puzzle one for a lot of people. Uh, doesn't really make sense. Um, until uh, we uh, discovered that actually most of these AVR proteins from bacteria actually directly injected into the plant cell through this uh, type 3 secretion system. And this is actually a very conserved system. Uh, in bacterial passaging of plant and animals, again. So you can see that uh, type 3 secretion uh, system, you can see under uh, electron microscope, like a syringe-like uh, uh, thing, uh, injection system, allow bacteria, in this case, to penetrate through the um, uh, plant cell wall. So plant cell has cell wall, unlike the animal cell, and injecting through the plasma membrane into the cytosol. So that explains why AVR protein could be potentially recognized by our proteins located inside the plant cell. Uh, and this translocation system actually is very common for other type of plant pathogen, uh, fungus, and uh, um, even, you know, nematode, they inject these uh, proteins into the plant cell as a very common uh, mechanism during infection. So gene for gene resistance, you know, become effective trigger uh, immunity, the common term. This is another way of depicting it. So you can see that uh, uh, bacteria are injecting these red uh, colored effectors into the uh, plant cell, and they're being recognized by these uh, uh, immune receptors, uh, either containing the koi koi domain, CC domain, or the TIA domain, uh, MBR, LRR proteins, okay? So it's uh, called effective trigger immunity. So 
When the uh, plant genome uh, was sequenced in early uh, 2000, uh, first from Arabidopsis, people were very interested to see how many R proteins are there in plants, right? In human, we know we have these antibodies, you know, has this, this endless combination of antibodies. You can recognize all kinds of microbes, right? Uh, 10 to the 14 uh, specificity. So we want to know how many uh, R proteins are encoded from plant genome. There was a puzzle, actually. When you see this, there's only hundreds of these genes. How can hundreds of genes immune receptors recognize thousands of microbes? So that's a really a big puzzle. And that was a puzzle based on this direct recognition. So we're saying that one AVR protein from pathogen can be recognized by you know, a particular R protein in the, in the plant. So you can't do this more than 100 times, right? Um, this puzzle was partially solved by this realization that there's a lot of so-called indirect recognition by R proteins. Um, of these AVR proteins. So uh, this is actually happening in many uh, diseases. So this is one example. Uh, imagine it has this light blue uh, uh, colored uh, circle. is a plant protein called Ring4 in Rhabdopsis. This protein is actually attacked by two AVRNs proteins, AVRB and AVRPN1 from Pseudomonas ringi. What they do is that these two AVR protein, once they attack a Ring4 protein, in this case is inducing the phosphorylation of Ring4 uh, of the plant protein. This phosphorylation event uh, induced by two different AVR protein is recognized by RPN1 R proteins. Okay, so in this case, one R protein recognized two uh, AVR proteins through this common modification of another plant protein. It's called an interactive recognition. There's actually another AVR protein called AVRPD2, which modified ring four differently. It actually cleaves the ring four because it's a protease. That is being recognized by another R protein called RPS2. So you can see there's a lot of variations of so called indirect recognition could potentially explain why a limited set of R protein could potentially recognize many different AVR proteins from different pathogens because they could induce modification of another plant protein. And that modification then is sensed by the pathogen to see this is not normal. It's not my normal me, okay? Um, so, so then there's another puzzle, okay? I'm being telling you this avirance proteins uh, from pathogen indicating when you have this avir proteins, then the pathogen is avirant, okay? Why would a pathogen send avirance proteins into the plant cell to become avirant? Uh, no, no, it's uh, no sense, okay? And so that's a puzzle three. Why would the pathogen send avirance protein into the plant to be recognized by our proteins? What is the original function of these proteins, okay? So, I remind you this again. So we have been talking about this effective triggered immunity because these particular cells contain R proteins. The plants are resistant against pathogens, okay? In this case, the effective proteins or avians protein are basically are not good for pathogens. They're being recognized. Actually, in most uh, plants without resistant proteins, these effective proteins or avians proteins are doing something else. They're actually suppressing another branch of immune response called pattern triggered immunity. So this is depicted on the left. So pattern triggered immunity is distinct from effective triggered immunity. Uh, they use different signaling uh, pathways, but they are normally suppressed by these uh, effective proteins uh, to induce disease. Okay, so that's why you want to send these avian proteins into the plant cell because the R protein is, is rare. Uh, so what is a, a, a pattern triggered immunity? Uh, this branch of immunity is not triggered by effectors of the pathogen, but it's triggered by common patterns from microbes. That can be pathogens, it could be non-pathogens, okay? And so they are involved to recognize all kinds of microbes. They are probably more ancient than effector triggered immunity. Uh, they are probably more related to the uh, animal system and the immunity system. So one example of this pattern from bacteria called the bacterial flagellum. Uh, this is obviously very common because most bacteria have to swim, so they have to have these traits. And that common trait you now is recognized by uh, pattern triggered immunity. So uh, one example you can see the, here, you know, flagellum, uh, subunit uh, makeup of the flagella. There's like about 10,000 copies of this to make a, a viable flagella. Uh, flagellum has a conserved domain at the end terminus and the C terminus. Uh, variable region in the middle of the protein, and there's a peptide called the FLG22. These are 22 amino acid peptide, which is now used very common in the study of pattern trigger immunity for FRAC22. 
People have uh, identified uh, the receptor in Arabidopsis for FLAC22 and for Jalan. This is done by uh, Thomas Bolas group. Uh, very nice work. Uh, this uh, receptor looks like a, a traditional membrane bond receptor. You have roofs enriched repeat domain, which recognize the fragilin or FLAC22 peptide, but then you have a kinase domain inside the plant cell that transduces the signal to do phosphorylation. So it's very similar to animal signal receptor system. Um, uh, the, a critical question is, is this receptor important for disease resistance, right? Okay, so this is done by um, uh, Cyril Zipfels uh, and the Thomas Boris group uh, uh, many years ago now, they created this uh, uh, receptor mutant in Rhabdopsis. Uh, so this mutant will fail to recognize fragile or bacteria, including pseudomonasoringi. On the left, you have a Y-type plant containing the full functional FRS2 receptor. On the right is the uh, receptor mutant. You can see, you see more disease after infection of pseudomonas. Uh, in the uh, receptor mutant compared to the white type, indicating the receptor is very important. The importance of receptor is actually most obvious if the infection is done by putting bacteria onto the leaf surface, okay? For bacteria to infect the plants, bacteria has to actually go into the leaf, and once the route is through uh, stomata. So these are macroscopic pores of plant leaves that allow plants to uptake CO2 to do photosynthesis. But the, the uh, stomata pores are big enough for bacteria to go in there. So uh, for a long time, people thought this is a passive process. The bacteria take advantage of the open pore to get into the uh, plant tissue. Uh, but I just told you, so the, the, the uh, FOS2 receptor uh, mutant phenotype is most obvious when you inoculate bacteria onto the surface because it has to go through the stomata to infect. Uh, if you inject the bacteria directly into the uh, uh, leaf bypassing the stomata, there's not much difference between the white type plants and the immune receptor uh, uh, plants, okay? So why? It turns out, uh, actually my group figured out, this is because these uh, uh, stomata cells, that uh, each stomata actually made up with two gut cells, they actually can recognize uh, fragilin and, uh, as, a, as a molecular pattern, and then they close the pore as a first line of defense against bacterial infection. So this is kind of interesting immune output, very unique to plants that are recognizing the molecular pattern and, 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 and do this uh, st stomata closure as first line defense. So uh, to summarize uh, uh, this part of talk, there are two uh, branches of plant in the immune uh, uh, system. One is involving pattern trick immunity, probably very uh, ancient. Uh, it evolved to recognize all kinds of uh, pathogens or non-pathogens, so the plants won't be eaten <laughs> by these microbes that, because plants are really rich in sugars and other uh, uh, nutrients. Uh, but then uh, pathogen has evolved factors to shut down the pattern trigger immunity as a mechanism of pathogenesis. And this is a, a called the effect that triggers the susceptibility. But then plants are smart evolved this uh, effect that trigger immunity to recognize individual effectors, or used to be called avirulence proteins, to activate the second branch of immunity to uh, fight against these pathogens. So this, uh, if you go into the weed field right now, you have this continuation of evolution. Sometimes pathogen wing, sometimes plants wing. What we want to do is to uh, identify a way to speed up the evolution so that we can fight against plant emergence of new diseases before they become a problem. So now I want to acknowledge uh, colleagues who actually gave me some slides for this talk. Uh, so including the slides I have, Silo Zipfo uh, provided a few uh, interesting slides uh, for this part of my talk. Thank you very much.